So most of you probably know that the longest running ceramics annual is organized by Scripps College in Claremont. Their annuals are curated by artists, but their own work is not included in the exhibitions. Beginning in 2016, AMOCA invited the curator of the Scripps Ceramics Annual to have an exhibition at AMOCA at the same time as the Scripps Annual. Last year, we mounted an exhibition of Joan Takayama Ogawa's work, uh, and this year we're pleased to have an exhibition of Patsy Cox's work. The 74th Scripps Annual, Stories Without Borders, Personal Narratives in Clay, opens next Saturday. There are postcards in the lobby on your way out the front door tonight. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Patsy Cox. So Patsy was born in Thailand, hopefully I'm not taking too much from your, your no, 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 speech. No. Um, Patsy was born in Thailand, grew up in Massachusetts, and finished high school in Missouri, but that wasn't the end of her roving nature, obviously. Uh, she's lived in Alaska, Utah, and Delaware before settling in Los Angeles. She received a Master of Fine Arts degree in Ceramics and Sculpture from the University of Delaware. She's a professor of Visual Art and head of Ceramics at California State um, University at North, Northridge. She served as the president for the National Council on the Education for the Ceramic Arts, otherwise known as NSICA. Uh, she has exhibited both nationally and internationally. Her work has been featured in catalogs and books and periodicals, including, including Ceramics Art and Perception and Ceramics Monthly. She has received recognition for her work in the form of awards and grants, most recently from the Durfee Foundation, and the Investing in Artist Grants from the California Center for Cultural Innovation in California. Please join me in welcoming Patsy Cox. Thank you, Beth Ann. Um, first, I want to thank all of you guys for coming. This is Saturday night, and I know most of you don't live here in Pomona, and so some of you that drove four days and four nights to get here starting like last week, thank you so much for being, it's so meaningful um, to me that you're here. So I also want to thank Beth Ann Gerstein and Amoka in their partnership with Scripps to make the space ava available for the work that you see um, that's up now. They're, they have a really great partnership, and like Beth Ann said, their opening is next weekend. So there will be another lecture and kind of like another, there will be, um, you could get some white wine there or, or some red wine. And there's like, there's like a band, it's a great opening. Um, and I just want to do a little shout out to who I just called Batman earlier, which is Kirk Delman's here. Um, he's kind of the superpower that's behind what is scripts. So I'm not going to talk about prior year's work, my installations, or the evolution of my work for like the past 25 years. I want to talk specifically about the work that's included in the vault space that I hope you guys kind of like just walk through there just for a second so you'll recognize some of the images. Usually I start with uh, everybody has a lecture that they're adding to and subtracting depending on what the event is or what the show is. I had to start from scratch because my partner was like, that's not going to fly. I have seen this so many times. Um, so if it's a little rocky, we're gonna, it's going to be a little painful, I think. I hope maybe not as painful as I'm uh, thinking it might be. So just bear with me. <laughs> that, that was super appropriate. So, um, so I don't want to preach, and my statements are not meant to be divisive, but rather about a new normal that I'm experiencing and struggling through, and it's kind of a shared experience. And I'm trying to convey to you the things that were going through my own mind as I made this new body of work. There's not really an art therapist that an artist can go to to say, can you tell me what my work is about so that I can tell other people what my work is about? And so I'm still sort of negotiating what this work is about, because I've just made it. I haven't even processed or digested it, really. So I'm just doing it in front of you right here, right now. I'm going to start with this image. Uh, this is my certificate of citizenship. I was not born here in the U US. I'm a naturalized citizen. These are some of my papers. Um, this is my birth certificate, or so I'm told. It's not in a language that I can actually read. Uh, these are documents, uh, this documents like really intimate details of my birth, and I don't know what it says. 
These papers are the reason that I was able to obtain citizenship. So this is a petition for adoption. So, and I'm going to try to explain this so that, that it's not confusing. My biological parents had to fill out paperwork so that they could be my legal parents so that I could then get citizenship. I don't know if that makes sense. This was before the days of DNA testing. These are my actual adoption papers, um, which allowed my parents to be my parents on paper. <laughs> it's my international certificate of vaccination. So these papers are one of a million little things that government is responsible for, other than like driver's license, DMV, renewal, social security, taxes, voter registration, that kind of stuff. I never really thought about government outside of those things. Um, I think a lot about my papers in this day and age, especially when I travel outside of California and when I travel abroad. So for anyone that needs papers to say that they belong somewhere, it can be a little unnerving. This is an image of my immediate family, not so recent image. This is from the 70s uh, at a factory that my mom worked at. So my mom, dad, and two brothers, uh, it's a strange compilation of individuals, um, and especially on the East Coast at the time the picture was taken, and even more strange when we moved to middle America, Missouri, um, in the 80s. So in a small town, Missouri, we were the only people of color and several shades of color to boot. So we experienced, it, we experienced some challenges. Fast forward about 40 years from that image, um, in December 2015, I had the opportunity to get inside of this place. And here's the evidence. <laughs> I couldn't believe I got past security. I had arrived, it was a new day. <coughs> inside was the most extravagant holiday celebration I could imagine. There was food everywhere, there was wine. I was pinching myself at the opulence and the privilege of being there. So my amazing partner, who's kind of a superhero, um, through her work was invited, was invited to the Obama administration's Christmas parties every year. And every year I would be, I would be like, you take your mom, you take your dad, they'll be so proud of you. And she did, and her mom was proud, and her dad was proud. And so in 2015 she said, this is your last chance, and no one loves this guy more than you, because I, I Obama represented so many things that I value, his intelligence, his tone, all the stuff that made me proud to be American. So, I agreed. And I was prepped for the event by being told that we would get to look around the White House, walk around, maybe eat something, and like see people, like important people, and um, that the President and First Lady would come down the stairs and say a few words, and then go back up, and that would be the extent of it. So what happened, <laughs> um, so the presidents have all these parties for different constituents. So in the past, they pretty much did away with a lot of the photo lines, except for this year was like three photo lines. And we got this blue card, and it was, you know, get in line to get your picture taken with the president. I said, oh, I can do this. This is good. It's easy, you know. Um, so my partner and I stood in line in this room where... There's a big photographer's kind of set up, and there's an expandable wall, and so you don't really see anything until you get past that wall. So we wait in line, and as soon as we hit the wall where I could see the president and first lady, I was just completely awestruck, and I have never been awestruck in my life. I mean, these were like people out of the newspaper, and they were moving, and they were alive, and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And um, so. At that point, I, in my head, I was like, oh, I have got to tell him all the things he's done for me. My parents have health care because of you. I'm an in immigrant, first generation, working class, gay woman of color from a multicultural family. First to go in college, I'm standing here with my partner in the White House. Next, <laughs> POTUS and FLOTUS, like all this stuff was going through my head. And the moment we get up there, I, I get my arm around Obama, and he has his arm around me, and I'm getting you know, shawls over there. And, and I look up at him, and he's looking down, and I was so overcome that my eyes filled with tears. <laughs> to the point, like, I don't know if you've ever had your eyes filled, if you were to blank, it would just shoot everyone. <laughs> so at that point, I was just kind of like, my body just kicked in, and I, I screamed out, I feel like a Muppet! <laughs> as I said that, they took the picture.
picture, um, and that's the picture that you're looking at. <laughs> the Obamas saw that it was amusing, and, and um, Barack was actually like, oh, you are a good looking Muppet. <laughs> Michelle was like, um, why do you feel like a Muppet? <laughs> I couldn't help her, the Secret Service came in and ushered us away. So, <laughs> went downstairs in front of this painting of Eleanor Ro Roosevelt and I cried uncontrollably, uncontrollably for about 20 minutes. I, had, I couldn't believe it, had never experienced this before. I was, it was such a powerful moment for me. Um, I had taken so many things for granted and I completely was unprepared to recognize the emotional impact <laughs> of that experience. Um, prior to that visit, I didn't think so deeply about the tone that government sets for the country or its power in our everyday lives. Um, that day had a profound impact and changed me as a person in the way I view our leadership, our place in the world, and our relationship to each other. And it's the first time I realized in a visceral way the role government and its leaders had on my life and the lives of those around me. So, the campaign season of 2016, as you know, was pretty rough. Um, there was so much noise coming from so many directions. Facts became negotiable. Exaggeration was the norm. Telling the truth was kind of secondary uh, to getting the headline. Confidence waned. What were we watching? It was a train wreck. So one week short of a year to that date that this image was taken, here we are. So did we know what this year would bring then? The result of this election told me clearly that there were at least more than like 10 people that agreed with what this campaign and the insanity of this campaign um, stood for. So I want to give you a sense of what has inspired the work that's in the space now. <laughs> so Mouthpiece is a reaction to a cast of characters who've made their way into the, our living rooms, our radio broadcasts, our newspapers, social media feeds, news alerts on almost every digital device. My watch will give me these like tender little taps every time something comes up. And I can't turn it off because I feel like I have to watch it. I have to know what's happening. Um, our everyday life has been changed forever. So. I mean, at this point, it's, have you ever heard of a show called, like, Black Mirror? Mm -hmm. Like a, okay. So I'm going to ask you for just kind of like a, like a shared experience with you and I. So like, like a formal um, moment of silence. So, so like about 60 seconds. And I'm asking you in Black Mirror fashion just to climb inside my head. Um, and we're going to see some images together. And in my head, I'm looking at the mouths of the images I'm going to show you. So don't touch anything in there. Don't look under anything. Just like come in there with me. And we're going to do this for like um, for a 60 second moment of silence. <clears throat>
So there are 1,440 <coughs> minutes in a day, and that was only one of them. Um, so I know many of you recognize these voices and are much more like crazy um, <coughs> obsessed with this stuff than, than some others of us. Um, and you negotiate them in your own certain way. So this past year, these people were in the studio with me, kind of uninvited, um, and I couldn't turn away from them. So I'm not an expert in politics or government. I only know how that makes me feel. <laughs> and it's left me sort of scratching my head. I'm unsettled, I'm frustrated, I'm defiant, I'm angry, I'm so angry. I have more anger than I know what to do with. Um, this is why I can't actually watch The Handmaid's Tale on TV. I can read the book, and, but I can't watch it. Uh, I'm already upset. <laughs> so we live in a world where we hear and react to words like seconds after they fall out of someone's mouth. I mean, the, the shithole thing that just happened, like, it was so, like an immediate reaction, and everyone is reacting to it. And so we don't even have enough time to process. We're just programmed to react. So how does one in good conscience turn it off? It's like our shared pile of trash. What I get from the barrage is that I too have a voice and I need to be thoughtful about it and absolutely about using it in absolutely everything I do. So I put all the responses I have to the things I disagree with as well to the things I support um, into one of the places it's in my work. So to capture the ongoing barrage of news feeds, fake news, new, word, new words, new attitudes, confusions, I mean process makers, um, junkies will love this. I cast my own mouth, biting my lip, similar to that last image you saw, and expressing a certain expletive, you can pick the word, um, and I, I made a mold of it, and then I, I made a cast of that, and then I fired it, which means it, sh it shrunk down, and then I cast that and made a mold of it, and then shrunk it down, and then shrunk it down, and shrunk it down. So there are a variety of scales of my own mouth biting my own lip. Um, and that's how I made this work. So this piece titled A Font of Scion is initially made, um, was initially part of this exhibition, but it's actually at the Everson Museum of Art um, as part of this series. It's, it's about being without the ability to speak due to illness or incapability, in um, and all you can get out is whispered speech. And I thought about voices of the next generation and what impact all of this is going to have on their voices. This is titled Verklempt. It's a Yiddish word that describes a person that is too emotional to speak. This one is also at the Everson Museum. So I used the scale of mouths and T's to get the work um, in the work to get my viewer to decide whether the mouth itself is shrinking or growing, whether the capacity to speak is appearing or disappearing. This is polyphonic hush, which is actually in the show. It's many, many voiced silence. It's several hundred bitten bottom lips sunken into a nest that I intended to be made as um, from one long coil. So it's a reference to a constant news stream it's chaotic and unruly. Um, I thought about the state of a future generation that'll be spawned from the chaos and uncertainty and whether they will speak out or be silent. And the title, some of you may have noticed or may have not noticed, um, of some of the work in the show, but not all, come directly from the most popular phrases used by our commander in chief to describe <coughs> any given situation. So the title of this is many, many, many which refers to a descriptive <laughs> phrase that avoids talking about any specific numbers to give one the sense of a large number of things or amount of something, but in relationship to what we don't know. And this is, um, the title of this is Kofefe. I don't know if you've heard this. Um, through the past year, our president has lashed out at media for its coverage on him, and so we're all very familiar with the term fake news which is now an official entry into the dictionary. Um, it's a complex term. The title of this piece came from a late night tweet on my, uh, May 31st, 2017, 2.09 a.m. to be exact, that read, despite the constant negative, press Kofefe. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that actually went viral, and the internet tried to make sense of it. Um, 
it was a suspected typo for, for despite the constant negative press coverage. But it was being played off like it was a real word. <laughs> it was dealt with as, as if it was a word that had an actual meaning. So it gave meaning to the meaningless. So in the work, the piece is a compilation of mouths sitting in a nest using the coil as a reference as a stream of words balanced precariously on a swirled vortex. The coil is obscured by a lava glaze to hide what's underneath. Mouths sit atop and refuse to conform. This is titled Terrific Tumult. It was one of the first pieces I actually made for the show and probably the, what was on the announcements and things. Um, I was thinking about a flounder fish and the differing perceptions of its volume from the front and from the side, or like a puffer fish that puffs up uh, as a defense mechanism if they're threatened and they, shape, they make their shape more than double their size. And I also wanted to create something that signified chaos, but also had a moment of transparency. So I was thinking about the rhetoric of the wall, and I used the primary colors to highlight the openings through which you could see through the chaos. And I, in my past works, I have used these primary colors as metaphors for the mixtures of race, um, thinking about how you can make any color from these three colors. So the way they're installed in that space um, is you can actually see through this work to get a sense of the work that's behind it. And I'm trying to capture all those three colors in the background within the openings. And beyond that work is, is a piece called Total Gobsmack, with the word for gob me, meaning mouth or mouthful. And I actually was thinking of gobstoppers, which are hard candies, also referred to as jawbreakers. So this is a nest of mouths use, utilizing that color metaphor um, set on top of a chaotic nest, a place for the colors to mix. So I see these as eggs that'll be hatched. I took these out and then I put them back in and then I took them out and then I put them back in. I think they're important to kind of tell you, talk to you about the, the lava glaze on a couple of those people. This is the Eldrin Lava Field in southern Iceland. And there's, I have one of my awesome students that visited Iceland. She knew exactly what this was. It was this violent eruption where it covered 232 square miles of Iceland with basalt. And it happened in 1783, and it like erupted for five months straight. And there was hydraulic acid and sulfur dioxide. It killed 70% of the animals, 20% of the people. And then the sulfuric acid hazed over to Western Europe. And there was famine, and people died. Because when you get sulfur in you, all the stuff on the inside starts to swell up. And then you just like slowly suffocate to death. Um, so <laughs> it was this incredible disaster. And when we were there, I was thinking, oh, that's kind of like what's happening in our country. Only what's coming out is not from the ground. It's from, like, from, the, from a mouth. And it has like, these implications to touch all these different countries. This was actually, they're saying, um, one reason for the start of the French Revolution, because France was low on money, and they're like, we got to start taxing our people. And the people were like, we're not growing anything, so everything's dying, people are dying, we're all poor, and we're resentful, and then everything just went to hell. Here's a close-up of that. Um, I'm frightened that the years that we're experiencing will be recorded as some of the most destructive in history, actually. So I took that. And I was thinking about the shroud of moss that covers the landscape and saw it in two ways. One was in the way the moss obscured the landscape and it was impossible to know what was underneath. And then I was also taken by the resiliency and strength of nature to find a way to exist upon that trauma. And so this is titled Rich Blue Eldron. And you can see some of the lava glaze there. I left an opening in the work to signify transparency, and it's an opportunity to see what's on the other side of things to actually look through the work. So if you get just the right angle and look close enough, you'll see a mouth on the other side. And I approached this 
classy red Eltron in the same manner, using both the words rich and classy in the way it is used <coughs> through the mouthpiece in describing something that is very good, uh, in quotation marks. So that's disseminated through the media. So if something is rich or classy, it must be good, even though you can't really see what it is. Um, it's, it's shrouded, but if you look close enough, we can have something to say about it. The title of this is Believe Me. It is a common assurance used in today's political speeches. I'm using the coiled clay as a metaphor for words. They're also reminiscent of snakes or snake charmers. So I made these by extruding one coil through a small hole, much in the manner a 3D printer, a 3D printer prints. Only this is with semi-moist clay, um, and the printing platform is actually attached to a human me. So I'm calling this 3D human printing. Um, the coils are chaotic and tangled and haphazard and almost accidental. So that, this piece actually led me to thinking about the clay coil having a physical connection to rope. Which brings me to this. When a person is a disaster waiting to happen, the old saying is, give them, give, give them enough rope and they'll hang themselves. That might apply. And so this is titled, Enough Rope. And then I started thinking, well, how much is enough rope? I mean, this could go on forever. Every time I watch the news, I'm like, is something going to happen here? That's a deep breath. <laughs> this is a more hopeful piece, catalytic. Um, I mean, this could be a catalyst for change. That's what I have to believe in. People are angry, and we use our voices, and, and something's going to happen. So. These small separate pieces lay on top of a pile of chaos and they're free roaming and the mouths move and they're not shrouded by a nest and so there's several small unique sculptures that rest on top of one another and I like to think of this piece and these pieces interacting and communicating with each other. This is the last piece I'm going to talk about. Its title is Big League, Bigly, Big. <laughs> it's another hopeful piece, um, utilizing the newly popularized words big league, bigly, and big. There are three forms coming together in the center of the nest as they are displayed in the gallery and have a moment to communicate. If one is big league, and one is bigly, and one is big, who's the biggest because they're all pretty much the same size, or are they big at all and in relation to what? It's a thought bubble on the meaning of our newly minted adjectives. I'm actually going to leave you with this statement from Zachary Wolf, um, who is a CNN political digital managing editor, and he said this live on CNN, as to why it's so difficult to cover the White House at this point. Um, what does he say when he means words? Or when he says words? What does he mean when he says words? And that's all I have for you. And for you guys coming. Am I on the spotlight yet? <laughs> no, there are questions and answers. Any questions? <coughs> and if not, join us for a glass of wine and in the bowl. Nice, okay. <laughs>